Now that we've talked about reaction mechanisms, we can appreciate the fact that the sequence of steps in which a reaction occurs affects the kinetics of the reaction. And in particular, the slowest step is what dictates the rate law. Catalysis draws on this idea. And the intriguing situation where a molecule may be involved in the rate determining step that is first consumed, but then produced again later in the mechanism, meaning we don't need a full equivalent of the substance in order to accelerate the reaction. For example, if it happens to accelerate the slowest step in the mechanism. This type of species is known as a catalyst, and that's the subject of this video. Catalysis is an extremely important area of modern research because accelerating chemical reactions and directing chemical reactions down pathways, down mechanistic pathways we want them to go, allows us to access more useful, more interesting, more functional products more quickly. And this is going to enable chemistry to do more in the years ahead. Let's introduce the basic idea of a catalyst first. So a catalyst is a substance that accelerates a chemical reaction without itself being consumed. And there are two pieces to this definition that are important. The first is this notion of acceleration. A catalyst speeds up a reaction, doesn't slow it down, and it does affect the rate. The second part, though, is that the catalyst is not actually consumed. This means that technically it's not a reactant and it's not a product. It's not consumed, so it's not a reactant, but it's also not net produced, so it's not a product. It's something that gets used up in the mechanism, but produced again later. We see that in the second bullet point here, that mechanistically, catalysts are first consumed during the mechanism and then produced in a later step. And catalysts generally alter mechanisms in profound ways, and we'll see that when we touch on this reaction coordinate diagram, the right-hand side, here in a second. However, because they're not reactants or products, and they thus don't appear technically in the overall balanced chemical equation on either side, they don't alter reaction thermodynamics. They cannot make a reaction that's thermodynamically unfavorable, favorable, in other words. All they affect is rate. They're a purely kinetic phenomenon, is one way to think about catalysts. And the basic way catalysts work in the energetic sense is captured in this diagram that you see on the right-hand side. The red pathway is for an uncatalyzed reaction that, for example, goes by a single elementary step. And we know that because the step has one transition state. There it is right there and no intermediates. So the mechanism involves a single step. But notice what happens when we introduce some catalyst. The mechanism might change. And now we have a two step mechanism with two transition states. And so the mechanism has profoundly changed. And the thing to notice here is that the activation energy for the blue catalyzed pathway is much lower. Notice that the hill we have to climb, the energetic hill, is much lower for the blue pathway relative to the red pathway. So the reaction is much faster because the activation energy is lower. And this is leaving many other variables the same, leaving temperature the same, for example, and, and all that good stuff. The re reaction rate is just going to be much fa faster because of the lower activation energy. Another thing that I'll point out is related to this third bullet point. Notice that the energies of the reactants and products are the same for both pathways. And this reflects the fact that the catalyst is used up, but then produced again. And so it doesn't appear in the overall balanced equation, and it cannot affect the energetics of the reactants and products. The delta H of the reaction is the same in both the catalyzed and uncatalyzed pathways. This problem draws on our understanding of reaction coordinate diagrams and how they relate to catalysis. We're given two reaction coordinate diagrams for the same reaction. They have the same delta H, and I'll let you verify that on your own. It is worth verifying. One does involve a catalyst and one does not. The problem asks us to do two things. First of all, estimate the activation energy for each process. And then secondly, identify which one involves a catalyst. One of these is a catalyzed pathway and the other is not. All right, let's start by identifying the activation energy. So the activation energy is the energy difference between the reactants and the transition state. And these are both one-step mechanisms, by the way. So only one transition state is involved. So here, for example, in the left-hand diagram, we have a transition state that looks to be at about, uh, let's call it 32 kilojoules, and we have reactants that appear to be about seven 
kilojoules. So the activation energy based on those estimates of the energies of the transition state and reactant is 32 kilojoules minus 7 kilojoules. Let's call it 25 kilojoules overall. And again, that was based on the energy difference between the transition state at the top of the hill, so to speak, and the reactant. Let's do that same analysis for diagram B. We have, let's do that in red. We have the reactants here still at about seven kilojoules, but now the transition state looks to be at something like 21 kilojoules. So now the activation energy is not 32, but 21 kilojoules minus seven kilojoules for the reactants. And that comes out to about 14 kilojoules, let's say. So now to determine which is the catalyzed and which the uncatalyzed pathway, we only need to compare the activation energies. And notice that the pathway on the right, the reaction coordinate diagram on the right, corresponds to a lower activation energy, faster reaction. This is the catalyzed pathway. And notice that in both cases here, we're looking at a one-step mechanism. And so the mechanisms are probably highly analogous between these two reactions if we look at, for example, the bonds being made and broken. More often than not, catalyzed mechanisms are entirely different from uncatalyzed mechanisms with different numbers of steps, different types of elementary steps, this kind of thing. This is something that you'll see in your more advanced chemistry courses, that catalysis more often than not fundamentally alters the mechanism of a reaction but still accomplishes the same overall transformation of reactants to products. There are two types of catalysis that differ in the nature of the reaction system. And the first, and probably the more common and more easy to understand, is known as homogeneous catalysis. And in this mode of catalysis, the catalyst is in the same phase as the reactants and products. And typically, this is either the aqueous or dissolved phase or the gas phase. And so, for example, catalysis by gases of ozone decomposition in the atmosphere, where a gas is catalyzing a reaction of a gas to produce gases. Soluble Lewis acid base complexes of transition metals are common homogeneous catalysts in reaction solutions. And catalysis by enzymes in biochemical systems happen in aqueous solutions, the aqueous solutions of cells, for example, the cytosol. And so these are homogeneous cat uh, catalysts as well. And to dive into enzymes a little bit more deeply, these are extremely important catalysts for reactions that living things need to survive. Enzymes power the construction, or accelerate, I should say. Enzymes accelerate the construction of the molecules that we need to function. Enzymes allow us to harness the energy, the chemical energy built into, for example, our food sources and that sort of thing. And the basic idea of how an enzyme works is that an enzyme contains a pocket. It's a very large molecule, very large protein molecule, that contains a pocket that's the proper shape to fit the substrates. So the substrates you can think of as reactants. They are bound inside the enzyme active site through intermolecular forces, and that binding brings the substrates close together. They get so close here that they're able now to react very quickly with each other, and after they've reacted, the enzyme releases the product or products from the active site since after bond reorganization has occurred, the active site no longer fits the products. The two models that you see on this slide um, are slightly different. The left-hand model is what's called a lock and key where the enzyme is sort of locked into a specific shape. This has been superseded by the model you see on the right, which is known as an induced fit model. And the thing to notice with the induced fit models is, is that the binding of the substrates actually changes the shape of the active site. So if we highlight that, you can see that there's a slightly different shape to the active site once the substrates are bound. And this is typically how enzymes work. They're flexible. They're a little bit pliant, a little pliable. So when the substrates bind, there are some subtle changes that take place in the enzyme shape. And this actually helps accelerate the reaction by stabilizing the transition state involved in the reaction of the two substrates. This slide just shows a couple of specific examples of enzyme catalysis. At the top, you see the very large, very complicated looking structure of the enzyme glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. It's not so important what this enzyme does. The main thing I'll point out is that this is a very large protein molecule. You actually don't even see bonds and atoms. What you're seeing here is 
a rough depiction of the shape of the protein backbone. And you can see how it sort of assumes a pocket-like shape that's able to accept small molecules, for example, in a space like this. This enzyme is responsible for this reaction here, the conversion of glucose 6-phosphate, the reactant into 6-phosphogluconate, which is the product, as well as the conversion of a molecule of NAD plus into NADPH. And a deficiency in this enzyme results in oxidative damage to cells. And the reason is because NADP plus builds up in the absence of this enzyme, which essentially removes the ability of the cell to reduce oxidizing species, leading to damage from reactive oxygen species, for instance. The other mode of catalysis is known as heterogeneous catalysis. And in this mode, the catalyst is in a different phase or state of matter from the reactants and products. And the classic example of this is catalysis by a metal of hydrogenation. So here, hydrogen and ethylene are gases, and the product ethane is also a gas, but the catalyst is a solid metal surface, here the nickel surface. And what happens here is that the gas binds to or is absorbed by the metal, and hydrogen specifically is absorbed uh, onto the metal, and then the ethylene binds to the metal surface as well. Hydrogen atoms are transferred, and after that hydrogenation has taken place, the ethylene mole the ethane molecule, the product, departs. Another great example of heterogeneous catalysis is catalytic converters, which have a very large surface area of solid catalyst that converts gases into other gases, essentially. Dirty emission gases enter the catalytic converter, reactions occur involving oxygenation, so oxygen is provided from the air pump, there is a reduction catalyst, of um, the emissions and the oxygen, as well as an oxidation catalyst, and out the other side come clean emissions. Catalytic converters are keen for ensuring that our cars don't pollute the air too much. So here we've just scratched the surface of catalysis, really introducing the ideas of homogeneous and heterogeneous catalysis, and the foundations of how catalysts alter activation energy and typically mechanism to accelerate chemical reactions. Like I mentioned at the start of this video, this area is super, super important in research and in the everyday practice of chemistry. Catalysis is a very exciting area to be working in as we develop a better understanding of how to artfully and rationally steer chemical reaction pathways in ways we want them to go, selectively accelerating certain types of chemistry over others.